BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 156, Side Effects of Progesterone Replacement. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. For the last several episodes, we've been focusing on hormone replacement therapy as a global topic, and in particular, uh, the issue of side effects and risks and benefits of, of specific individual hormones. Generally, people say HRT, hormone replacement therapy, as a global term for estrogen replacement. And there are a lot of hormones that can be replaced and perhaps should be replaced. And so what we've been doing in these episodes is walking through each of the various hormones that Kathy works with in her office and replaces in some combination or other for people for whom that replacement is appropriate. So this week we're gonna talk about the next in that series. We're gonna talk about the most controversial uh, of the hormone replacements that are out there. We're gonna talk about progesterone. And as a sidebar to progesterone, we're gonna talk about something called progestins, which are more problematic than progesterone. They're, and, they're, synthetic, they're synthetic chemicals that act like a progesterone mm -hmm. in, in the body somewhat. They fake the body out. They fake the body out. Yeah. And we use them in birth control pills. Mm -hmm. That's part of the birth control pill. They use a type of estrogen, ethanol estradiol, and they use a, a progestin of some type, which is uh, agestin or provera, or now, now we have some progestins that help with PMS. Mm -hmm. And so um, those, but they all are progestins and they're synthetic. And we find that some people who are taking birth control pills have side effects, and usually the side effects are secondary to the progestin in it. Mm -hmm. And then that also occurs in postmenopausal women. The biggest side effects and the biggest risks are from progestin. But if they were taking progesterone, mm -hmm. natural progesterone, they would not have those same side effects or risks. If they were taking it or if they were taking it non-orally. Because the, the delivery method right. is also progesterone. important. Well, taking progesterone mm -hmm. orally yeah. as pure progesterone, they have one pill called Prometrium, progesterone mm -hmm. and oil, that is less risky than a progestin okay. on the scale. And then, then we go to then, I should be doing this the so other way. So you work way. your way down the checklist. Yeah, you work yeah. your way down on the level of risk. The highest risk mm -hmm. is a progestin. The next highest risk is oral progesterone. And then the least highest risk is non-oral progesterone. Just like we talked about non-oral estrogens, mm -hmm. non-oral progesterones, meaning you put it under your tongue, a vaginal tab, uh, a cream, a gel, those progesterones are lower risk than all of these options. Okay, so risk is a global term. Yes. What kind of risk are we talking about? Because people say, oh, that's risky. So is walking across the street. Well, the thing that made the WHI study, mm -hmm. which the Women's Health Initiative, women, yeah, 2002, the, right, that came um, that made it risky, mm -hmm. was not estrogen. The estrogen part of the study, and we've said this before, the estrogen, which was Premarin, an oral estrogen, actually had lower risk of heart disease, stroke, and uh, breast cancer, which right. is what most people are interested in, than the people who took nothing. So estrogen actually was, was low risk in mm -hmm. that study. Mm -hmm. They don't say it that way, but the thing that made it high risk and where they say, oh, HRT is a terrible thing, is right. just the progestin. Right. And that arm of the study, and so that's why I'm going one, two, three. The arm of the study in the middle is they didn't take anything. They were given placebos. One side of the study had hysterectomies and they just took estrogen which is how we treat people with hysterectomies. And then the other arm of the study took up progestin and estrogen. Mm -hmm. And it was a specific one, it was Prem Pro. They used one progestin and one uh, estrogen that is usually given to women. It's, a, it's the most common hormone that is given postmenopausally. So they used that and they found a slight, which has been way 
right. way extremely... Well, but it's frightening. If somebody says, well, you have a greater risk of getting breast cancer if you take this than if you don't, even... It I was mean, a barely to, to significant risk. risk. I understand that. But, however, <laughs> the, the but everybody... But if you get it, it was significant 100%. to you. Yeah, exactly. If you get it, it's 100%. So, right. And that applies to everything. Sure. But when you have progestin and premarin or, or an estrogen, that was the risky part of the study. So that's why talking about progesterone or right. talking about that group of hormones that we give women called pro progestins is very controversial. Well, and so Some doctors, everybody's got a different opinion. It, it comes back to the globalization of the data. When, when people say, oh my God, don't do hormone replacement therapy, the reason that they're saying that is because somewhere in the background of their database, they've heard about the problem with progestin, but not identified it as progestin. They've identified it as hormone replacement. You always have to look and see exactly, which is, is hard for mm -hmm. somebody who doesn't read studies all day, mm -hmm. that to look at the, it's hard for those of us who do read studies all day, mm -hmm. but you have to look and see what the actual problem was, and you have to be a detective, mm -hmm. or your doctor has to be a detective, and you have to be able to ask them, well, what did the study actually say? Right. Which thing in the study, there's always variables, variables? in a study. Right. They, uh, the population that they choose to study, was that different than the rest of the population of the mm -hmm. United States? Was, were they more obese? Were they, and in fact, in this study, they were. And were they older? Yes, they were. Yeah, in this were. study, they were looking at women with an average age of 68. So that means there were people in their 80s right. and people in their 40s. But in general, women who take hormone replacement therapy begin in their 40s. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really a good picture of the American public who starts taking hormone replacement therapy. However, then you look at, was it like what I'm gonna get at the doctor? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, if you have a uterus, you might have before that time gotten Prempro, you might have gotten nothing. Or if you'd had a hysterectomy, you might have just gotten Premarin. So it mattered whether you had a uterus or not. And here's why. Progesterone is only given to women who have a uterus so either progesterone or progestin, most of the population doesn't need progesterone after menopause unless they're protecting their uterus. So that's why we give it. Protecting their uterus in what way? What would Protecting their uterus from bleeding, mm -hmm. protecting their uterus from precancer, and protecting their uterus from endometrial cancer. Okay. So you can so find progestin it in any works to help resist those diseases. Right. And women who don't have a uterus, who have had a hysterectomy, they don't have that issue anyway. Right. It's not Because you're not going to get uterine cancer if you don't have a uterus. Right. So. so you don't, that's right. So you don't need the progesterone if you've had a hysterectomy. So those, in general, patients are just given estrogen if they've had a hysterectomy. And that was the safest way to take estrogen, mm -hmm. was alone. But it's not the safest way if you have a uterus. So it all depends on you. It all depends. I mean, this is the very right. individual. And it has to be looked at individually by your doctor. Which a is doctor what you say that about says, all of these. Right. It's, it's, if your doctor says, I never give hormones, <laughs> okay. I mean, I've yeah. heard that so many oh, times. Yeah. Yeah. I've come from my doctor and he says, I'll never give hormones. I right. mean, that's kind of a ridiculous statement because some people need them. Many people need what them. What if you need thyroid medicine? Right. That's well, a hormone. They, yeah, and they may not give that either. Yeah. So that's, but that's a gynecologist, usually speaking. Then there's a group of doctors that give everybody hormones. They give them the same thing, want the same type of hormone. That may not be good for everybody. And they may not have realized that progestins are the issue. So, then, a so a doctor just globally says, I never give hormones. It's like a preacher that says, I never read the Bible. I read it. I know what's yeah. in it. <laughs> Right. <laughs> that's true. That's true. I read it once. Yeah. So. Um, but and that's true. And I've never updated my learning. I've yeah. never I've never read it for more inspiration. But uh, so. So, yeah, there's those doctors among us who they're just so frustrated with all this information. Honest to God, on their behalf, they've heard there's yeah. a study that says this. There's a study that says that if you if this isn't what you do all day, if you're seeing patients all day and you're not an academic person, you could throw your hands up and say, forget it. 
I can't do this anymore. I'm not doing hormones. I understand that. It's very frustrating. Well, and a, an element of that is the old saw about figures never lie, but liars always figure. I mean, people... <laughs> People are pushing an agenda. That's they true. skew the information to support their agenda. That's and true. so if it's a drug company, if it's a progestin company, if it's a hormone doctor. If it's the government. If it's whoever. If it's the <laughs> government. Exactly. The data gets skewed. And so it's, do you have time to sit down and read the pros and cons and evaluate it? Which is like one of the appraisers. reasons. It's like appraisers. What do you want it to be worth? Yeah. That's how much do you, you need your house to study, clear study for the with. loan? Yeah. You want to prove this. Yeah. So how can I make that happen? Yeah. So I understand, I understand that theory, too, because many times I'm wanting to see in my patients what I'm physiologically should happen. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it does happen. But then there's all this, there's this little group of people who aren't responding normally with normal physiology. So there's something I don't know. So then it's my goal to find out what. Well, but that's kind of my personality, and that's not every doctor's personality. In, the inquisition of information is is difficult. No, I'm, but you like I've got to binders be the all over my you know? office yeah. of articles. Yeah, I am not binders of women, but no. binders of articles. Binder, binders of articles. <laughs> I mean, I have eleven big binders of articles on yeah. the various hormones, and I add to it every week when yeah. JAMA comes out and, and right. then endocrine, the Endocrine Journal comes out and the OBGYN Journal mm -hmm. comes out. There's so much information. We have an information dump. That's why sometimes your doctor goes, I don't know. Yeah. It's not that he doesn't know. He's just, he or she has just given up. Right. It's easier just to say, forget it. So, so what I usually do is I look at, I have more time to do this. We have long consultations. And I had the benefit of looking at everything about the patient. Did they do well on birth control pills, which is an, es an estrogen and a progestin? Was that okay? Well, then if they did, then they're probably going to do well on any type of progesterone. And I only give bioidentical progesterone mm -hmm. because it is the safest. So my, my theory on medicine is find the safest way, see if it works with that patient, mm -hmm. and do it. If it doesn't work with that patient, then you can go to a little less safe. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they're going to have a side effect. It means their possibility of having that side effect will be increased. Well, and part of what, what you would want is for those physicians who have given up, who just say no or I don't know, is to have them say instead, that's not my area. Let me send you to somebody that does right. know, that works with that every day. I mean, I'm trying. I'm actually trying to make their lives easier. Yeah. It it's one way. I mean, I realize they may not view it that way, but I'm trying to take one thing off their plate. I know that general OBGYNs. I I was one for almost 30 years, are extremely tired, extremely exhausted yes. from delivering babies, and they by the time they get to their office, that's that's their low energy point of the day. They're not in in adrenaline surge. So I'm trying to help them by take over the difficult hormonal patients. And that's what I'd love to do. Mm -hmm. And many doctors are now doing, sending me those patients that they just, it, they don't want to deal with it or they just can't figure it out. Mm -hmm. And in general, happily, I've done so, I've taken care of so many patients that I right. usually figure it out. Right, right. And the research is coming in fast and furious about things we've never even thought about like receptor sites. So. So, I mean, those are things we've never even thought about. We thought about giving hormones, but not how they attach to the cell and, right. and, the, and the molecular basis of it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So that's giving us more understanding. Let's talk about progesterone. Is, okay. Let me just talk about a couple things about progesterone. The side effects of even Okay, so, so, so we're going through the checklist. We, we said right. no progesterone, uh, no progestin. Uh, oral bioidentical. Oral bioidenticals. So when you take non-oral bioidenticals mm -hmm. or non-oral progesterones. Right. You can what still have effects? some side effects. Right. Interestingly enough, progest progesterone, and now we're talking bioidentical from now on, progesterone actually acts on the uterus by stopping bleeding. Okay. It stops bleeding. I have a few people that it starts bleeding. Mm -hmm. And you try that start stop thing a couple times and mm -hmm. then you realize I have to do something else, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about the something else in a minute. But that's, that's one problem. Sometimes, most of the time it stops bleeding, sometimes it starts it. The, and there's no way to tell who's going to do that. So you have to, that's trial. Then the other issue is hunger. 
some of my patients get on progesterone and they get so hungry. Yeah. So those people do not want to gain weight. Not one of my patients, maybe one, needs to gain weight. Mm. And so they do not want that. They want, they don't want to be hungry. They don't want to eat too much. They don't want to eat unhealthily. And this kind of gives them that PMS hunger. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to take it. And so we have to think of something else for them as well. Some, and we do. Um, the other thing is fatigue. Progesterone, bioidentical progesterone should always be taken at night. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't take it during the day because it makes you tired. Unless you want to sleep during the day, then okay, go for it. But, but you should take it at night before you go to bed. Mm -hmm. It's very relaxing. And in fact, there are some of my patients, even with a hysterectomy, very small percent, they need their progesterone to go to sleep. Everything else gets better with estrogen and testosterone, but they still can't go to sleep. They still can't relax. So some, some people even, you know, there's always exceptions to the rule. Right. Some people, even with a hysterectomy, do I give bioidentical progesterone to? Other, other issues, some people get swollen. Some people get unswollen. It's but, but that's unusual, why you practice individualized medicine. That's right. So you, it's not one size fits all. It is not, and it's going more toward that because that's right. faster. Right. We, you know, mm -hmm. we we have to we have to um, yeah. Yeah. get so, through the day. So first, we try to do for you what we do for everybody. You you get the pill everybody gets. Not me. <laughs> then, if you sort yourself out into a smaller, more at risk or more suffering population, then we send you to a specialist. Right. Right. So. And it's it's pretty much like that, but a computer could do most of that except yeah. for the physical exam. Mm -hmm. But we're hoping that that doesn't happen because that's not how we were all trained mm -hmm. to practice medicine. It was look at the person right in front of you. Take care of that one person. Block everything else out because nothing else is important except the human being in front of you and what is best for them, which means lowest risk, best outcome, and then you have to test it. Give them what you think is right in progesterone and then have them come back in a couple months and then retest them, ask them their, the side effects, and then right. go from there. Right. So others that you haven't mentioned, uh, loss of hair, painful intercourse. Yes. It uh, makes the vagina really dry like in breastfeeding. breastfeeding. In breastfeeding, the dominant hormone is progesterone. So when you were breastfeeding, if you felt kind of crazy... And if you felt, and if you had terrible uh, dry vagina and painful intercourse, then that's that's something that would make me think, oh, I've got to do something different than progesterone to protect her uterus because mm -hmm. that's not going to work. I have one patient who has um, had psychosis with progesterone. So, wow. So I have to be. I have to think of something different for her. Uh -huh. You know, at the outset because I yes, don't want her do. to risk that. Right. So that's, so those are some of the other things that we find with, with progesterone. You, you'll see that either when, when we're pregnant, we, got a lot of, we have a lot of estrogen and we have a lot of progesterone. Mm -hmm. And usually our hair grows when we're pregnant. It's an anabolic state. Usually that means that we're, we're making a baby and we're replacing our muscle tissue. And, right. and that means our hair grows. And so do, so does our, so do our nails. So in that case, that's okay because estrogen is the one that's ruling that. So then, and growth hormone, and you know other hormones. Right. There's many right. other hormones, so don't don't think that's the only one. Okay. However, then when you go to breastfeed and you're only and you only are making progesterone, then and prolactin, mm -hmm. then psh, there goes your hair. So generally, there's a huge shed after delivery and after the estrogen's withdrawn. So the same kind of thing happens when progesterone is the dominant hormone, we're giving a lot of progesterone, not much estrogen, then we see some hair loss. Okay. So there are side effects, but in the most part, they are manageable once right. you identify They're not life -threatening what side works effects. for a particular individual. Mm -hmm. But there still then is a category of women for whom the progesterone is just not an option. Right. And there are three general recommendations mm -hmm. among which you have to choose what's best mm -hmm. for this woman who can't take progesterone, and what, right. what are those things? Well, the, one of the options is observation, mm -hmm. and that is I'm going to look at her uterus, even though I'm giving her estrogen, I'm gonna look at her uterus every year, and if she builds up a lining that's greater than four millimeters, then she has to have a biopsy of the uterus to prove it's not cancerous. Okay. Um, a second is, there's probably more than those options that I, 
that I listed. There, a second is that we give progesterone about every three months for just seven days uh -huh. and try to empty the uterus out. Because okay. when, when we give so short progesterone, of, like, them to have a period. Have a period. So yeah. just clean out the uterus. They can suffer through it for a week. Right. So, um, so that's something that we, we offer them. Most people don't want to do anything right. like that. Yeah. So there's, there is a surgery called an ablation, mm -hmm. which is very, very easy to do. Usually it's best done uh, with an ultrasound before and an ultrasound after to make sure that... To measure the lining. To measure again. the lining right. and to make sure that the uterus can actually be ablated. And that, now there's like three different ways of freezing, a hot water, a hot balloon. So define ablation. What ablation is that? Ablation means the lining of the uterus is burned or frozen out. Okay. So if you don't have the lining of the uterus, it's kind of like a cantaloupe. The seeds mm -hmm. are the lining. Mm -hmm. The meat is the muscle. Mm -hmm. So we try to get rid of the seeds. That's where the cancer starts. Right. So okay. and and grows. So that's where it is sensitive to to estrogen. So we and would need progesterone. So what we do is we get rid of that lining. So we either burn it, freeze it, scrape it out, and uh, or there's like a um, like an electrical a little electrical charge so, that they can burn it out with, like so electricity. So the the woman who can't take progesterone. What you're doing with her, essentially, with all of these things, is a cancer watch. Right. A yeah. cancer watch or cancer prevention. Yeah. Or the last thing is a Mirena IUD. Mm -hmm. And Mirena IUDs are the only IUD that this works for, works with. And that's because they have a little progesterone packet mm -hmm. attached to it that lasts five years. So okay. nothing orally, nothing, and it doesn't get into the system. The progesterone's working just within the uterus. Okay. So it doesn't so, go through the rest of the body? In general, it doesn't. There are some people that are so sensitive to progesterone. I've had a couple of people like that. Yeah. But having said that, in general, 99% of the population, this works, and it's easy. And they don't have to think about progesterone. They take their pellets for every four months. They get right. the Mirena IUD, and every five years, they, they have to think about it. It's not for birth control. It's for, for uh, stopping the bleeding or stop the... Mm -hmm. um, because we do this with bleeding, if they have bleeding on progesterone, these are the same. These are the same answers. Okay. So we just need to manage the uterus. Right. Honestly, sometimes people have have huge fibroids that they've never attended to, and when we give them estrogen and not a lot of progesterone, they sometimes bleed a lot too. Sometimes hysterectomy is the final answer, but rarely is that something that we go to. Well, but again, you're going through the checklist of risks and benefits. Right to defeat the symptoms that are causing distress in their life. Right. And, that's, and, that's, and so that we can make it safe. Yeah. It's always about being safe. All kinds of treatments are said to be risky, but in the right hands, oftentimes they're not risky because mm -hmm. if you know all the side effects, you can avoid them and you can make it safe. Mm -hmm. And so that's why estrogen therapy for uterine cancer generally, unless there's already a cancer there, when you start menopause, then in general, it's not going to cause uterine cancer if you do all these things. You have to be compliant. You have to take your progesterone. You well, have to do you the have things to be you say. Compliant. That's got to be. It, then it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know. Then it's something. You know. You. It's your your responsibility to be healthy as well. So what we have been talking about in this series of hormone replacement risks and benefits conversations is uh, we, we did a couple on estrogen, we did a couple on testosterone, now we've done progesterone. There are some other hormones out there and, and we may continue this series and, and talk about them as well, but these are the three that are, are predominant when, when the phrase HRT, hormone replacement therapy, comes up. Most people still hear estrogen, whether that's what's said or not. That's ERT. Uh, and that's ERT. ERT is estrogen, HRT means in Other the vernacular, yeah. well, it means testosterone. I mean, excuse me, it means estrogen and progesterone to most doctors. To most doctors, and but testosterone is an HRT. It's, it is an HRT, and, and thyroid we would like to is make an HRT, yeah. and progesterone is an HRT. Mm -hmm. So, look beyond the labels. Have a conversation with your physician. If your physician is not comfortable with what they know or what they do about the research, then look for a specialist who knows this area. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, 
visit BiobalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.